Thank you all for joining Carl Van Horn. I'm uh, honored to have George Pruitt, Dr. George Pruitt with us today. Um, I've always been happy to call him George because my brother was George. And so it was easy for me to <laughs> make that transition. And so was my father. So we had a lot of Georges in the family. Um, he is a renowned educator and higher education leader um, around the country and, and certainly for more than three decades in New Jersey. Um, and um, most importantly, he's, he's just a very wise person in the best sense of that word. He's a very thoughtful and wise individual. And he's written a book. Uh, um, and uh, it is available for sale, uh, Rutgers Press. Um, we'll put a link up on that. I don't think George is expecting the movie rights to be sold to this book, but um, he could star in it if, if that is in fact what happens. Um, and um, he's really got a very interesting story to tell uh, and told it in this book. And uh, I've known George for over 30 years. Um, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, most of our transactions have been brief and business-like. Um, so I, I learned a lot about George by reading that book and it was most enjoyable. Um, and also learned about it, a lot about his perspectives on, on topics of the past and today. So what we're gonna do is have a conversation and then towards the end of that conversation or hour we've set aside here, we'll allow or open up opportunities for people to ask questions. And in the Zoom world, that means putting in a question in the chat. I wanna get started and welcome again, George, and thank you for joining. Uh, I wanna start by asking you a fairly simple question, but one that I think all of us would like to know, which is what motivated you to write this book? What message are you wanting to people to take away from this because you have a lot to tell and there's a lot of messages in here, but we're really motivated you to do this. Well, thanks, Carl, and thanks for having me. I want to immediately say, I want you all to know that I put on my scarlet sweater specifically for this occasion. I, I left, as I mentioned before, I left off the tie because I thought Carl's not gonna be wearing a tie. And, then and, I, said, and, I, and I put the tie on because I wanted to be respectful to you. So, <laughs> so anyway, but thank you for having me. And I look forward to this. Uh, that I, I, I struggled with whether I should write a book. And I did it basically because people kept telling me that I should write a book. You know, I like to tell stories. And, I, and as I would talk about things, people would say, well, you need to write a book. And I really struggle with that because everybody's got a story, uh, but that doesn't mean that everybody should write a book. And I, in fact, have read some books that I'm from friends that have read that I'm wondering, well, why do they write the book? So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I won't uh, say that to me too, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I thought I had a lot of encouragement to do it from a broad scope of people that I respected that wouldn't tell me that if they had, if they didn't, uh, if they didn't mean it. And, and the more I've been reflecting on it, you know, I've had over, I've built up a portfolio of over 50 years of experiences. And I've been having, I've had the extraordinary opportunity to be involved in and spectator to a lot of really important events. And I thought, what do you do with a portfolio of experiences like that? Do you take them with you or do you try to pass them on and the hope that what you've been, where you've been and what you've done is useful and might be instructive to others so that they can avoid mistakes you have made and so they and they may learn from things that, that work well. Uh, so that, that was basically the motivation, hoping that there was value in this and doing it for other people and that it would be, at least be interesting. And so that was really that that was really why I did it. Well, one of the one of the topics that you cover uh, and write about movingly is your horrible experiences in the segregated South as you, when you grew up, and especially what happened to your aunt and your cousin uh, who died um, because they were black, as you put it in, in the book. Um, I'm interested in having you talk about that and really where we are today. You know, uh, Martin Luther King, of course, famously said the arc of justice uh, bends, the arc bends towards justice. And uh, and that's, of course, dozens of years ago. You know, where are we today? Do you do you still have that optimism, or are we still stuck in the miserable past? 
I think we, there, but I, I don't think there's a reading to say that we're stuck in the past. I think there's been extraordinary progress. And, 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 and as I tried to describe in the book, I was born in a little town called Canton, Mississippi, 20 miles north of Jackson, born in my grandmother's home. And I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, two very difficult places if you were black to be and to grow up and to live. And it was very challenging and very difficult. Uh, I, I, in retrospect, I recall about how frightened I was. I didn't know it at the time. But you know, my grandmother lived. Uh, my grandparents' home was in a was is in town in Canton. It wasn't in the countryside, but it was on a street that wasn't traveled very often. And I would have the fear about a car when I hear a car coming down the street, <laughs> and that you know, and I wonder, well, who is that? Where is it? I mean, I I was I, I was actually afraid of being there. And of course, the rest of the time I was in Chicago, and although Chicago I grew up in. It was, it was not nearly as bad as it is today in terms of what's going on in the South Side. But I had four classmates that were killed. Uh, it was not a safe place either. And it was racially rigidly segregated. So, you know, it was a very challenging place to grow up. But when you're growing up and living in it, you are aware that it's not good. You're aware that you want to change it. You want to change. But it's all you know. And as I have reflected over it, you know, that question was posed to an extraordinary woman that I knew in Canton, a woman named Flonzie Brown Wright. Flonzie was the first African-American woman ever to be elected to a public office in the state of Mississippi. And she was elected in, to be a registrar, voter registrar, registrar registry, registering people to vote. And in Canton, you would get shot for voting. And so to be the, so the idea that you would actually go and register people to vote, it was a very vicious thing. Her life was threatened. She had an extraordinary story of her own. She wrote a book. You should Google it. It's a very interesting book. But I was with Flonzie about a couple of years ago on a Zoom where she was talking to some younger, some college, African-American college kids, and they were bemoaning about the challenges that they're facing today. The, uh, the the institutional racism as they perceived it, the implicit biases that they faced as they understood it. And she made a comment to them. She said, you know, things are bad. Things need to be better. You should not be satisfied with them. You should take your, your commitment to do something about it. But I want to also tell you that as bad as things are, they're better now than they have ever been. And that is true. Now, that doesn't say that things are good, but they are better off today than they have ever been. And someone with her arc uh, uh, and her view, uh, you know, I have to reflect. There's, you know, I, I can basically buy a house anywhere that I can afford. I'm not worried about being threatened if I try to register to vote. Anywhere in the country, there are places in the country that it may be more difficult to vote. But your life isn't going to be threatened if you vote. There are more people of color in holding political office today than, they, than ever in the history of, of the country. It is, it is certainly a significant thing when that we had an African-American president of the United States. That was never conceivable in my life. In fact, I was shocked when it happened here. I, there are two things that I never thought I'd live to see. I never thought I'd live to see a black president of the United States. And I never thought I'd see the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> two re remarkable. Yeah things. I remember after Obama was elected and the commentators were talking about his, re his election was a, the opening to a post-racial America. And I fell out laughing. I mean, I appreciated the sentiment, but that was a huge stress, stretch to suggest that Obama's election was, was, was the hard major of a post-racial America. We were a long way from being there. So in terms of those things, it's, it's extraordinarily better. Uh, opportunities are extraordinarily better. Yet at the same time, the, uh, the gap in, in, in wealth and education and opportunity for people of color is, is still extraordinary and enormous and, and self-destructive. As a society, we cannot have a future given the, the people in this country that, are, that live in poverty, uneducated, uh, trapped in, in, in pockets of violence, the failure and collapse of urban education over the years. I've watched 
the public school system in Chicago that I had, which was bad and segregated, and we demonstrated against it. It's worse now than it was when I was in school in terms of the outcomes, the completion, the violence. Um, my former high school, I saw a chart on it, on it that talked about the uh, low enrollment in the school. It was overcrowded when I went there. The percentage of the st students that are still in my old high school that had uh, proficiency in reading was 2%, and in math, zero. Uh, that's, I don't know how it, it can get worse than that. That's not acceptable, and we have to figure out ways to fix that. But I am also mindful that it would be, it would be wrong to suggest that we haven't had extraordinary progress. We're seeing and it's sitting at an institution right now, and I, I, you're the host, I'm your guest, that has a wonderful African-American man as president. And he's an extraordinary guy. Uh, that, 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 that couldn't have happened any earlier in my lifetime, uh, even in a place like Rutgers. So no, there, there's been extraordinary progress. There's also extraordinary risk. I think it is less along the issues, the direct issues of race, there are other issues of class that I think we are, don't get attention paid to. Uh, the diversity of them within the minority community makes things more complicated because it's easier and simpler when your racial issues are, are black and white. Well, they're not black and white now. They're black, white, yellow, brown, uh, gender-based. Uh, so that's a more complicated scenario, but still an important one. Uh, in my entire life, I was, you know, I, I was concerned about the political polarization, particularly around racial issues, particularly in my experience in the South and in Chicago. But we were never faced with the challenge about whether the Republic was going to survive. Uh, there was no one in the political spectrum on either side, anywhere, that was suggesting that you don't honor the results of a free, fair election, that make up facts that planned on physically assaulting the capital of the United States. So uh, we're at great risk, but the risks are different than I ever thought we would have faced in the time that I was, that I was growing up. Yeah, I mean, one of the interpretations of the what happened on January 6th is that it was a race riot, that it was basically white nationalists attacking the Capitol for that reason, and Trump, of course, former President Trump enabling that. Is that your interpretation of that, or do you see it? Yeah, oh, ab absolutely. The, there's a good part of the country that is threatened by the growing and inevitable diversity of the country. And the sense that from people, well-intentioned people, that we are losing our country is palpable, and we have reverted to tribalism. And that tribalism is irrational. It, I have tried to talk to people. You know, I have, I have, I have been militantly uh, nonpartisan and independent in my life. You know, I, I grew up at a time when most of the people that I were fighting were Democrats. All the people in the South were Democrats. I mean, my Mayor Daley in Chicago, who I was fighting. Well, it was a different Democratic Party, also. Well, absolutely. That that's <laughs> absolutely that's absolutely right. Strom Thurmond is not the same as. Uh... Oh, that's absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely For right. For those who don't know who that was, he was a, led the Democratic Party segregation, segregated group, basically. Yeah. Segregated. And I also remember that when the Civil Rights Act got passed and when the voting rights got passed, every Dirksen brought Republicans across the aisle and gave Mike Mansfield the votes to break the Southern filibuster. So it was yeah. just the politics was, was, was very, very different. I don't think that would happen today. So... Uh, yeah, it's, I do think the tribalism, the, the irrationality of tribal membership over facts, logic, and reason, when you've tried to talk to people uh, about just what the facts are, the whole notion about alternative facts. You know, I was shocked and astounded when 600 people went to Guyana, committed suicide, and poisoned their own children because of their commitment to a cult. And so what I have watched, this mindless allegiance by a frankly large number of people to Trump, 
and, 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 and him as a symbol of tribal identity that overrules reason and logic, uh, that's frightening. I haven't seen that before, and that's new for me, and it's very scary. One of the, the other issues that's on the horizon is potential uh, ending of affirmative action as we've known it in higher education, right? There are a couple of cases before the Supreme Court, which I'm sure you're following. What what do you think the implication is that will be if they basically severely limit the ability of higher education institutions to do what we've done for the last 20 or 30 years? Well, I think it's bad, but on the other hand, What's more disturbing to me is not so much the attack on affirmative action, which is a legally defined kind of structure and process, is the attack on the notion that diversity itself has value. Mm -hmm. That's much more serious and diverse. I mean, the affirmative action bit is complicated because the definitions are all over the place and the understandings of it are all over the place. But I mean, one of the things I talked about in the book is the attack on the Bar Association and on middle states accrediting body because they put a standard in there that institutions should be evaluated on their commitment and effectiveness in having a diverse student body and faculty. And the accreditors were saying that not, there was a social justice component of that, but there was the major focus is that people learn better when they're exposed to different people and from different cultures and different environments, it strengthens the learning environment. You're having political leaders now attacking the whole notion that diversity itself has value. So it's a much broader assault. Uh, the affirmative action, fighting the attack on affirmative action is a is more symbolic than it is uh, uh, real if the commitment to diversity is still there. Institutions basically that are diverse are diverse because they do it with some intentionality and have a commitment to it doesn't require the classic test of old, old school affirmative action processes. Right. Yeah, one of the one of the proposals that's been around for a long time is that some advocates support is to do diversity more around economic status than, than the color of people's skin. Um, what do you think about that line of reasoning? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, the, the original premise of affirmative action is that the, the, the country needed the talent of its citizens to have a viable future. And that we should not exclude access, the country should not be limited and excluded from access to the talent of the citizens based on artificial things like race or gender or uh, other kinds of artificial things. So there was a broader purpose for doing it besides the oppression of, of, of racial groups. Uh, I think, the th I think the issue is what's important about higher education, what attracted me to it, why I fell in love with it, was that higher education is a, the, a, 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 if not the major vehicle for building human capital and empowerment for the society. And I want a system that empowers people and develops people and grows people and makes people avail av available for for beneficial citizenship in the nation. And I don't want anyone shut out of that process based on their race or economic status or gender or any other kind of artificial barrier. You know, I was, I'm was i a fan of Thomas Jefferson and I know people, his history find it, it uh, challenging in some aspects. I personally think it's unfair to judge people in the 18th century on 20th century views of things, it's just more complicated than that. But if you listen to the founders' debates and the Federalist Papers on one side, Jefferson's rebuttals on the other side, there was enormous insight in terms of the character and nature and the requirements of what it takes to make a democracy. And the shorthand version of that is that this is the first time in human history where the citizens are in charge, they are not subjects. And how are they going to handle, how are they going to be the shareholders of the country, a country that was basically populated by illiterate farmers? And, and one of Jefferson's powerful things was that we have to be concerned about the education of our citizens to be citizens and the requirements of civic engagement and that the country was going to be successful. 
we have to develop our citizenship to be able to carry this responsibility. And in my judgment, that is still the major function and purpose of our education and, and education, period. So it, it is very dangerous. I think we need to be looking at outcomes. What is it that we have to do to empower our citizens, to develop them to the best of their potential? And we have a variety of potential. Not everybody ought to go to college. Uh, but I think everybody ought to go through an educational system that figures out what's the talent and asset and skill set we have and how do we make those skills available, not only for people who can be the architects of their personal lives, but also how we can collectively be the architects of a country that's worth fighting for and living in. One of the, of course, I want to pivot now to where you spent the bulk of your career as president of Thomas Edison University. And that is developing uh, a university where students were distant. They weren't actually on, on the property, which uh, as you point out in your book was uh, extremely innovative uh, at the time. Uh, it came out of a, a movement uh, that you called it a movement. And I think you're right in calling it that, that um, has grown in fits and starts over the year. And then during the pandemic accelerated, right? We had, very little people in in the classrooms for two years at Rutgers, for example. Um, and I, I guess what I'd like to know is where you think that is now, and, and given the changes in technologies and people's expectations, um, is it thriving? Is it being challenged? Um, how do you view that from the standpoint of institutions uh, and employers and how they evaluate people who go through this essentially an alternative route that doesn't include, you know, being on campus and, you know, and all those other things that come with a, a resident life as opposed to learning through the process that you do at Thomas and Edison and many other institutions around the country. Well, again, like most things, they have gotten increasingly, the whole notion of how to respond to this is increasingly complicated. Uh, distance education, as we, part of the problem is we don't have definitions for this stuff. So we get into a lot of discussions because we don't agree on what it is. And so we're talking about different things. One of the things I put on and talked about in the book is that when I was a freshman at the University of Illinois, the largest course in the university was psychology one-on-one. -on -one. It was taught in a huge lecture hall all over the campus. We sat on TV monitors and watched a videotape recording of Dr. Delaney. Uh, the next reiteration of that was that you could stay in your dorm room and watch the lecture uh, on video of Dr. Delaney. Now that was in 1964. Uh, was that distance education? No, it, it, it wasn't. And it was terrible instruction. I wouldn't recommend it. It was, it was, it was terrible. I, I talk about this notion in the book that Delaney made a comment about education. He said education is most valuable, but it takes into consideration the personal experience, tailored to the personal experience and background of the learner. And we all erupted in laughter because that was the opposite of what we what our experience was. We, we were, as far as we can tell, the first college or university in the country to develop a complete degree program delivered online. And the reason we did that, the problem we were trying to solve was an access issue for mature adults. Uh, I will tell you in a heartbeat, and with Simon Causes Angela. I think it's probably the second or third best way to have education. It solves a problem for adults that can't be on a classroom at 10 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Or a physical, a physical requirement is an access point only for the people that can meet it and a barrier to everyone else. So we were trying to solve a problem about how to have high quality uh, collegiate opportunities for people that couldn't uh, uh, that may have uh, physical and time restraints. That was the problem we were trying to solve. So the courses were specifically divine, designed with that purpose and with that client base involved. The other thing about adult learners, at least the kind of adult learners that we dealt with, they most of them had been to college. 98% of the students at Thomas Edison had gone to college and were coming back to finish. They were fairly sophisticated, self-disciplined. They were paying their tuition out of their own pockets. They had a very strong consumer drive. We we're buying the, paying for this. We want a good return on our investment. They were, they were very demanding. 
And we wanted to be able to demonstrate that this new tech, this new approach produced the same, the same high quality outcomes that students were producing from a traditional classroom. And so our standards were very high. Uh, for four or five years in a row, our graduates had the highest pass rate on the CPA exam of any college or university in the state. And we have some pretty good uh, accounting programs. So we're, we were able to document and demonstrate those kinds of outcomes, and we, we were very proud of that. The problem comes is that this apply approach works for the right clientele in the, in the proper setting. The other thing is our approach to designing coursework was very different. We found basically to do this well, you need expert course designers. And we attracted some of the finest course designers on the planet. And the courses were designed by them and the content experts were scholars that populated the content. But the course designers knew how to make the uh, technology engaging, interactive, uh, re self-reinforcing. And their skill set was critical in having a high quality course. What most colleges and universities are doing with their quote distance education courses, they bring in some faculty, they teach them how to teach, how to handle the technology, say go forth and teach the course. Uh, that tends to have you have results that are extraordinarily uneven in that regard, and the outcomes are very uneven. You're also applying this to traditional aid students; they don't have the motivation and self discipline to stick with it. If you're in this kind of course and you get behind, you're in trouble. And so. Like any tool, it depends on the skill of the craftsman that uses the tool and that the tool, right tool is applied for the right purpose. When it is, you get good results. When it isn't, you do not get good results. And I think defining, you know, institute, I always objected to this institution being called an online school. I thought that was terrible language. We were an adult-centered institution. What defined us and separated us were who our clients were. And everything we did was designed around the needs of our clients. Uh, today, everybody's offering online courses with varying degrees of quality. Some of the some of some schools have taken it seriously, they've invested in it, they've trained the faculty, they've got good course designers, their products are really good. Unfortunately, most schools don't do that. They don't have the resources to do that, they don't have the technology to do that, and Frank and candidly, the faculty doesn't have the will to want to do that. If I had a choice between taking a course online or taking the course and having physical engagement in common with a scholar or faculty member, I would take the physical engagement every time. But if I didn't have that choice, then a high quality distance online course is a good option. One quick illustration of this, I did an evaluation of the US Army War College. You could argue, arguably one of the finest academic institutions in the world. Uh, they had two approaches. They had Carlisle Barrett, Pennsylvania, these flag, potential future flag officers came there, 25 students in the cohort, Exceptional stuff. But after the week I was before I was there, uh, Colin Powell had just left. The chief of staff of the Chinese Army had been there lecturing. These this was these were the best of the best. Uh, they had another cohort, same people, the same rank, that because of their duty assignments couldn't come there. It was a, it was essentially an online distance education version of the, of the war college. And some of the my colleagues on the team were just skeptical that they were prepared to accredit. Uh, the in-person place, we're saying there's no way you could duplicate this on the online thing. But the military being the military, they were way ahead of colleges and universities in outcomes assessment. And they were able to document actually that in terms of the outcomes they were looking for, the online, the distance education cohort actually outperformed the ones that were physically there at Carlisle Barracks. Carlisle Barracks, had a, those people had a different experience. I think a much more richer experience. But if you're looking for a learning outcome, the experience was the same. So bottom line is it depends on who's doing it, for what group and how it's done. And right now it's uh, it's very uneven. It's very uneven out there. And it's a challenge for the accreditors to push colleges and universities to demonstrate that the outcomes they're producing are comparable to those that are being produced in a more traditional setting. The other thing that's happened, of course, as you know, I study labor markets and know a lot about what employers think. And, you know, they are uh, continuing to, uh, I, I guess I would say, escalate and make louder their complaints about post-secondary education. 
in a couple of different ways. I mean, one of which is to say, well, there's no assessment of learning. There's assessment of a time and seat. You know, we know that, but we, and we know there's a grade, but we don't know what they know. And they're also pushing for either to create their own internal educational strategies, which of course train them to what they need for that firm, uh, or and or they're they're pushing for more um, experiential learning through internships and cooperative education and the like. Um, and I'll just tell you a quick story about that to illustrate that. I I know without naming the companies. In New Jersey, there are a number of major companies that will only hire people that previously interned with them and were, were cooperative education students with them. That's all they hire. And they don't care where the institution is. They don't care whether it's Harvard or Rutgers or whatever. But as long as they are already, in a sense, get to see the product in advance, paying them obviously at a lower salary, then they're willing to do that. Do you see that trend as well, that, that basically the bloom is off the rose of higher education in terms of performance and of convincing employers, or is it employers are just becoming too selfish and dissatisfied with what they used to get? Well, I, th I, think, I think that's going to continue. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily bad. I mean, one of the things, as you know, it's the other thing I write about in the book, I spent half my life in, in accreditation at every level. Uh, I chaired middle states for a long time. And the accrediting community agrees with the employers mm -hmm. that the colleges and universities have an obligation to have quantifiable measure, measured outcomes, learning outcomes of their students. What do they know and what can they do? And there's been huge resistance among faculties around the country about doing that and to the point now that most accreditors have re required that. And one of the biggest things that I've watched schools get in trouble is on the assessment part of meeting the accreditation standards. All of the what used to be regional accreditors require colleges and universities to be able to demonstrate in some objective way what their students know and what they can do. I think it's a fair question to ask an employer that is, uh, that is looking for someone that has a particular skill set to be able to demonstrate that they have that skill set. Now, on the other side of the coin, I think it's a huge mistake to voc vocationalize education, too. And, it's, and that's, that's the other thing that I, I see really dangerous. The notion that you go to college to get a job. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the figures recently, and I defer to you because this is your, certainly your wheelhouse. But about, last time I looked at it, about 27, 28% of the people in the workforce were involved in work that was directly related to the undergraduate major, teachers, nurses, accountants. So that meant, means that around 78% of us are, we're involved in work that had nothing to do with our undergraduate major. The world of work changes constantly and evolves. One of the things that I have on my desk, I'll hold it up so you can see it. You, you know what this is, but I bet a lot of people out here don't have no clue about what this is. This is a slide rule. I got this a bunch of freshmen in college and the professor said, don't save money on your slide rule. You will use it for the rest of your life. It will be one of the most important things you'll ever buy. Well, that didn't last very long. No one has a slide rule, no one knows what they are. They, Obsolescence in the workforce is constant. When you talk to a lighting corporate executive, yes, there are things they want students to know and do, but the most important thing is they're looking for people that are teachable, that know how to learn, that are self-disciplined, that are analytical in their thinking, that have good communication skills, that know how to lead, that know how to work in teams and groups. Uh, those skill sets come from a variety of college educational experiences. When I was at the War College, I asked the students how did their undergraduate education prepare them for their actual work? These are all people that are at least colonels. Most of them had gone to West Point or Naval Academy. They were trained in high tech engineers in technology, those kinds of areas. And what they said was the biggest deficit in their undergraduate education, and if they could do it over, they wanted more in the liberal arts. Uh, it, they would want to know more things about anthropology and comparative economics cultural aspects that, so that they could understand 
because fight, war fighting today is, is, is as much different diplomacy as blowing up stuff. And for senior executives, they, they said they wish comparative religions. Uh, they wish they had studied those things. That's still true in corporate in corporations too. There's a disconnect and a lot of CEOs that you talk to, I'm sure are telling you the same thing. But the problem is they send their recruiters to the campuses and they only wanna to talk to the business majors. And so the CEO is talking about, I want people that are broadly educated and have liberal arts, but the recruiters are going to the business department. So the corporate sector is still trying to figure that out as well. But the world of work today, you can't, it changes so rapidly. You need people that are adaptable and flexible and teachable uh, and self-disciplined and, and, and willing to learn and thirsty to learn. And that's what the workforce needs to be. And employers recognize that, but we have a mismatch between the way we educate people and what the work with the workforce is requiring once they get in there. And so the companies that are trying to make sure to have a better match between what they need and who they hire, I think that's a healthy thing. I think the higher education community is gonna to have to get used to that. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think, I think actually when I think of, uh, it's hard to overgeneralize, but companies are kind of divided into two types. The one are, I think, what's always been there, which is they hire resumes. You know, they hire they, they hire badges, nameplates. Okay, so if the president went to Penn State, they hire a lot of Penn State graduates. If the president went to Princeton, they hire a lot of Princeton graduates, etc. Why? Because well, they must be good because the, the CEO is, and then they're not going to face any pushback from the senior people if they're hiring people that are just like them. They look just like them. They went to the same places. So the other are the are the institutions that say, no, we, we want to see the product before we, we buy it, right? And that's the one I was alluding to. And there's really sort of a, another one which was really in the category of, and this is the newest one, which is we want to test before we're going to hire them. And that is the skilled-based hiring process which completely skips the credentialing process to turn it over to a test or a variety of tests. Now, each of those has their own disadvantages, but um, I think, you know, from your perspective as having done, live so much in the testing world, you know, testing students' ability to perform and accrediting them accordingly, you know, this should create more opportunities for institutions like Thomas Edison, because you're already in that business. That's that right. And a, a lot of the earlier relationships that we had with corporations came from our assessment uh, background in terms of one of the schools that cre helped create prior learning assessment. And the pre-divestiture, I think, that, you know, for me, the, uh, the, 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 the company that most involved it was embodied that was the old AT&T, the pre-divestiture AT&T. Mm -hmm. Our master's of science, our first graduate program was a master's of science in management. And AT&T came to us, asked us to develop the program. And they specifically did not want an MBA. And uh, uh, they, they wanted us, they, they gave us their successful the people that they defined as their most successful managers, the people that they wanted to find other people like. And we did a lot of exhaustive assessment trying to come up with what were the attributes and characteristics of the people that they were trying to, that they wanted to, to, have to hire. And they paid for all of this. And we built the curriculum of the program around the assessment that we identified that they were trying to, the kind of product that they wanted to hire and produce. And it was, it created an extraordinary program. It was very successful. The first, first two cohorts of the program were all AT&T employees, all being paid for by AT&T. And it, it really worked well. One of the reasons that Thomas Edison graduates were so successful is because our entire curriculum was outcomes assessment based. Every way you got a degree, earned a credit at Thomas Edison, was, was backed by an objective assessment where the student had to demonstrate what their competencies were, what they knew and what they could do. The only area where we didn't do that was the acceptance of transfer credits from other colleges and universities. Sure, yeah. And so uh, we had employers that were, were actively recruiting here because they were saying, we know what your students know and what they can do. 
it's not, we don't have to guess. It's not based on seat time. It's based on outcomes that were measurable and can document and can be demonstrated. So there, there is an opportunity for traditional higher education to respond to that and to be able to create partnerships and relationships. Uh, again, you know this better than I, but I, there was a task force on higher ed attainment that ACE put together. President Obama challenged us to be number one in attainment where we used to be. Yeah. There's some arguing about where we are now, but while this task force was alive, we were probably around 17th of the 50 countries. South Korea was number one. Uh, and so we were looking at, and so we had, I'm sure one of your colleagues, uh, I can't, Tony Carnival, I know you know him, he's in Washington. He's just a founder of data about the labor, labor market. What he told us then was that in the current economy, there were about, there's an annual gap of about 3 million jobs of what the current economy required and what higher education was producing. And I remember watching you do a presentation in the governor's office where you were looking at that in New Jersey in terms of where you documented and demonstrated the gap between what New Jersey companies needed and what New Jersey colleges and universities were producing. And that gap's been around a long time. We need to be more doing, having more uh, intimate relationships with our employment, the people that are generating our economy and the people that are generating the workforce for that economy to figure out how to close that gap. But it's a bit, it's a real challenge. And it's, it's also resulted in a lot of overseasing of jobs and other things because they can't find people here to, to meet those, those meet that gap. And given the demographics, uh, it's likely to get worse because you know, where we are, there aren't as many people in uh, coming up in the next generation to fill those job opportunities. And when you cut off immigration or make it more difficult, we lose all that talent as well, which is, shooting ourselves in several feet at the same time. Um, one of the other the other questions is you have I wanted a specific one is in New Jersey, as you know, and this is not just only in New Jersey, but in New Jersey we have a huge number of people who enter college at either county college level or the so-called four years or whatever they're now six year institutions, uh, the baccalaureate institutions, and they drop out. They stop out for a variety of reasons. Uh, medical, personal, life happens, things happen, money, et cetera. Uh, and here we have the opportunity through PLAs and other strategies to get them through. And yet th there seems to be not a mismatch between that opportunity to actually get them their credit so they can finish and the actual supply. Do you have any thoughts on that, how we can tackle that specific problem here? Because it's a huge one. Well, I think we have a new, uh, there's a new dynamic that I, I'm not sure I understand, but I do get it. I'm watching enrollments tank, particularly at the community college sector. I mean, they just, they're just yeah. really, really horrible. People are opting out of higher education and we lost people through COVID, which was understandable. And it's built, it's slowly building back, but it's slower than people anticipated and it's very uneven. I also think that gets back to my other issue about the, the downside of talking about you go to college to get a job, because in this economy, you don't have to go to college to get a job. And uh, there are people that are, I think, making short term assign, uh, assumptions about that by saying, well, what, if I'm going to college to get a job and now I can get a job and everybody's crying to hire people, people aren't going to college because they've already got a job. That, that, that's that's dangerous and short-sighted for the economy and for and for the for the society. So, I, I I do I do worry about that. There are a lot of trends that are going on where we don't have the policy apparatus, and even the mechanism, the, the institutional uh, structure, to have thoughtful, rational policy discussions that align what our assets and what our resources are around the problems that we have. And the political culture is pretty much broken too that used to do that. Uh, it's hard for a state through its public policy apparatus, not only in this state, it is true, especially in the state, but it's true of all the states, to do anything that's got to last longer than the term of a governor. Uh, because it, every governor comes in and basically starts the clock when they take office, they look at their own trajectory in the office. And so things that require decade long <laughs> things 
it, they, it, that's just almost impossible to do. The government has lost the capacity to do those things. It used to do those things. It's very difficult for it to do those things now. And some of the problems we have require thoughtful, long-term, non, not bipartisan, nonpartisan actions to try to make sure that we have the kind of society we need, the kind of economy we need, the kind of workforce we need, and the kind of place, culture and society that we want to have. But do you think do you think there could be, in terms of that lack of supply, uh, the opportunity to help those folks that got partway and actually wanted a degree to get a degree by going to the assessment route and getting their credit, credits accordingly? You know, they might be only six nine credits away from finishing. There is absolutely a huge, enormous potential for that. Colleges periodically revisit it. One of the things that Thomas Edison used to do, we had a thing called a statewide testing and assessment center where we did prior learning assessment for students that were attended or recruited by all of the colleges and universities in the state, didn't matter. It takes a special kind of expertise and competency to do that work so that you have a high quality assessment. Uh, I've also seen the prior learning assessment movement get in trouble because colleges and universities thought, well, we can do that without the capacity, without knowing how to do it. And then they would go out and crash and burn Every time I hear someone talk about the notion about get credit for life experience, I cringe. No reputable college or university gives you credit for an experience that you've had. You get the credit for some outcome, some learning that has taken place pursuant to a valid, reliable assessment of that learning. But yes, we did that and it was very, it was very effective. It was resuscitated uh, before I left uh, under the Christie administration. It was something that uh, Rochelle Hendricks asked us to do. We did it again. We had about seven or eight colleges and universities that kind of signed up where we could do that. But it's a, you're, you're right. We have this huge pool of people that started college, haven't finished. They, they represent a huge asset. One of the reasons that Thomas Edison was founded was to look at the impediments and barriers these people had for coming back remove those pediments, create high quality opportunities for them. And that's why when I got here, we were at about 3,000 students. When I left here, we were about 18,000 students because there was a niche that we fit, that we served. We were specialists in what we did. We had the confidence of the higher education community and the corporate community that what we did was a very high quality and we could demonstrate that through objective outcomes. And it was a very successful, it was one of the things that propelled us and why we grew so quickly. I want to pivot to another important uh, issue for the for your institution and one, one of our members of the audience asked this really good question to talk about your role in, in Trenton and what you've done for that community. Obviously you have a long relationship with the, uh, I guess I would call them the uh, royalty of the Trenton family, the Watsons and so on, which I, we, we all respect and, and know for many years, but you've done so much in Trenton. Talk a little bit more about that and other urban communities around the state. Well, I've always believed that a college and university, and, or university has a citizenship, civic obligation to the communities in which they live. And I grew up at a time when most colleges and universities did, did not and in fact, tried to build walls or to wall themselves off from the communities in which they live. And I was particularly angry at the University of Chicago. I, at one point in my life, I grew up with them, you know, stone throws on the other side of Washington Park. Uh, University of Chicago at that time was one of the largest slum landlords in the city of Chicago. So not only was it not engaged in, in developing its community, it actually exploited its community. And I was always deeply offended uh, by that. And I, I remember going to a conference and there was a session on a, something called stewardship of place. And I was touched by that. And I thought, I want this institution to be a good steward of the place in which it resides, not simply an occupier of its real estate. And so from the day we, from the day I got here, we began to try to engage in the city to see what are the kinds of things that we could do that would be supportive and helpful. And you know, one of the things that I'm proudest of was a thing called the John S. Watson Institute for Public Policy. And, and it started, Trenton was our first client, uh, where when Doug Palmer became elected, elected mayor, he basically came to us and said, you know, I read on this thing about new vision for Trenton. I've got all of these very difficult problems in this city. 
well-intentioned people, but we don't bring any special wisdom and insight than anyone else. I'd like to know what's the experience in other cities? You know, what, you know, what works, what doesn't work? College, state, city governments don't have the, 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 the capacity to do that. Would you do it? And we, were, we already wanted to do it. We were just looking for a client. And uh, we created what started out as the Trenton Office of Policy Studies, which later, later morphed into the John S. Watson Institute of Public Policy. And before I left, you know, our biggest and most important client was the New Jersey Urban Mayors Association. And there's legislation, there, there's a stack of bills that are on the books that we literally wrote uh, in response to developing real world policy solutions to things that urban mayors uh, were dealing with. We did not want it to be a think tank. Think tanks have a role in place, but what think tanks do is they do autopsies. When something happens, someone will study it and write a book about what happened. But when some mayor is, you know, three o'clock in the morning scratching his or her head about, you know, what do I do about needle exchange program? Should I do it? Is it good? Is it bad? What are the consequences of it? I want to know what's the experience in other cities, what works, what doesn't work. We did that kind of research. We did it confidential because the mayors, we, they, we would talk, we would give objective analysis and give it to the mayor. The mayor had to figure out what they wanted to do with it, whether they wanted to do it or not, what the consequences were going to be. We did stuff in terms of the urban environment. How do you, you know, these are important environmental issues. How do you deal with environmental challenges, water resource issues? And so we were sort of a high powered consulting firm for all of the cities of the state. We had a small, brilliant staff, but we would hire, we would go get the expertise depending on what the problem was. And the client was the mayor at the city that, that contracted with us. And it was an extraordinary, still is to this day, an extraordinarily effective public policy tool. Um, it's now at Kane University. They, they migrated there. And so they are at those, those uh, Joe Youngblood and Barbara George Johnson and Nikki Sheets and Anna Garcia, some of these people's names you will know and, rec and recognize. They're all at Kane now, still doing that work. The John Watson Institute has moved to Kane, so it's not at Thomas Edison anymore. So, so Dr. Ruppelet stole them from you, or uh... <laughs> no? He created a hospitable place for them. Where you think about <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> yes, I I, 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 I like Lamont a lot. Well, that's great. No, I, I, of course, I admire that work, and um, it was definitely needed. I mean, we're an urban, the most urbanized state in the country. And um, a lot of mayors don't have the capacity on their own to hire uh, that type of talent that you were able to, to put together. Well, the other thing we were able to do is that we were a lot of the talent we brought in were people at other colleges and universities that had particular expertise. And I know we brought a lot of record people in a lot of cases but using the special expertise of that institution as well. Well, listen, we're at our time and uh, we could go on for much longer, but you probably want to have dinner. I, I do want to say that um, I uh, I really enjoyed this. I, I know everyone was on this, I'm sure, appreciated what you had to say. You've had such a, a important and, and long career and uh, I'm sure you'll continue to contribute not only at your own institution, which you built from something into much more than something <laughs> over that period of time, and um, and help contribute around the country, not just in New Jersey. So um, I encourage people to to buy the book uh, or steal it from someone else and read it. It's it's a really it's a good read, and um, I enjoyed it immensely. And as I shared with George, uh, um, knowing that uh, we like the many of the same people and the same <laughs> same music and so on, um, was also a good way to connect. And so. Um, Thank you so much, George, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. I enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, same here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you all for attending.